Hello everyone, my name is Lauro Parente and this is the Arbitration Channel. Today's event is part of a series called Arbitration in Two Words. And this, pro this project is sponsored by Quatre Casas, uh, Brazil and Portugal Mediation and Arbitration Chamber, Coimbra International Arbitration Meeting, Moraes Leitão Advogados e Valde Advogados. And supported by CRB Brazil, Portugal Very Young Arbitrators, Jovens Arbitralistas de Língua Portuguesa. To be part of this panel today, we are lucky to have Valéria Galindes, Galindes Arbitrage Founder, Partner, Arbitrator in Domestic and International Cases. Arif Haider Ali, Partner and Co-Chair in International Arbitration Group at the Cat LLP. Mr. Ali has uh, several academic appointments, include, including at Georgetown University Law School. And Anne Hyan Robertson, President of CRB, International Partner of Lock Lord LLP, Arbitrator and Counsel in International and Domestic Many Cases. To coordinate these discussions today, we are proud to announce Mauricio Gon, he is partner of GST LLP, arbitrator and mediator, Brazilian and New York attorney, and Florida foreign legal consultant. Mauricio, good morning. Thank you to having him here. You are muted. You are muted. No, no, okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, Lauro. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be part of this event, this initiative of Arbitration Channel, and more specifically to discuss some of the characteristics, peculiarities of two worlds, Brazil and the USA. Actually, we are going to see if we have indeed two worlds in the field of arbitration, especially in the field of international arbitration. So uh, to start our discussion, and since the, uh, the idea of this debate is to make some comparison between Brazil and USA in the field of arbitration, let me start by saying that um, just a little bit of a, a history. Brazilian, well, Brazil is a civil law country, as everybody knows, whereas the United States is a common law country. Brazilian Arbitration Act dates back to 1996, approximately 25 years ago. Bra uh, the United States, the Federal Arbitration Act is almost 100 years, dates back to the mid 20s. Brazil has ratified New York Convention in 2002. New York, uh, the United States has ratified New York Convention in the beginning of the 70s. So we have a huge, we can see a huge difference historically speaking, between Brazil and the United States. However, in the last 20 years, the last two decades or so after the Brazilian Arbitration Act has come into force, Brazil has experienced a huge, a huge development in the field of arbitration. It's not by accident that Brazil, under the statistics of ICC Brazil, uh, features as the second, third, fourth country in terms of uh, parties. Brazilian arbitrators are there. And um, so we've, we can see uh, an interesting, solid and robust development in the field of arbitration vis-a-vis -vis Brazil and Brazilian parties. So with that uh, brief introduction, I would, um, I would ask a very simple question and let me start with uh, Anne Ryan. Uh, we've, uh, we've seen um, this debate of civil law and common law uh, in arbitration, forum, fora, in debates, etc. Does this distinction, as of today, still matter or not? You look at things. Um, I think there's been a tremendous melding in terms of procedures, if that's what you're focusing on, between the common law and the civil law and international arbitration. The law itself is still different. However, if you talk to a general counsel and they're discussing whether or not in negotiations they have to give up the seat or they have to give up the law, 
they will be willing to give up the law as opposed to the seat because they see the seat is more important and they view the common law and the civil law, although maybe taking a different approaches always, or at least usually ends up in the same place. So I think that this discussion about civil law and common law actually has more to do with procedures than it does with the substances of the law and where you ultimately resolve an issue. Interesting. Uh, and this we can, uh, we can see, we can just try to travel a little bit backwards to see and to imagine what comes from the mind of the transactional lawyers when they draft the arbitration clauses. You've mentioned and that uh, parties may be willing to waive applicable law, but not so much the seat. Uh, Valeria, do you think Brazil now uh, is, uh, uh, or do you, do you see parties concerned about choosing Brazil as the seat, or this is no longer an issue, this is no longer a concern? No, first, thank you very much, Mauricio and, and, and Lauro, for, for the invitation. It's always ple a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and, and good morning to you all. I think good morning to everybody, although some are, are, are earlier than, than others. Um, regarding your question, uh, I don't see it anymore, actually. I think that we, regarding Brazilian interpret cert certain since, as you've mentioned in your introduction, Brazil was a later. Uh, at the end of the day, what we saw is consistency, although Brazilian courts still have um, resistance to foreign parties um, currently acting far more of questions. Uh, our um, assessment was... Let's imagine that uh, you are going to appear as counsel before a full common law lawyer, a full U.S. tribunal. Or let's assume that you're going to appear before a full civil law, a full Brazilian tribunal. That situation, that scenario per se, would that change your strategy as far as the art of the advocacy is concerned? How to convince a US tribunal or how to convince a Brazilian tribunal? Uh, good question, Mauricio, and uh, uh, good day to everybody. And again, th my thanks to the organizers and to Mauricio and to my uh, co-discussants uh, for allowing me to participate in this uh, event. Yeah, I think I think that the today my answer would be different from uh, from from 1996 uh, when I first got involved in uh, arbitrations in in Brazil. Uh, so let me let me answer the question in the following way. You first start with Brazil, the culture has developed mainly because people like yourself and Valeria and, and you know, many of our other good friends who have forced an education on and also on the judicial community. And so what's happened, I think, in Brazil is that the not only has the education been forced, but it has been well resulted in, I think, a greater acceptance of arbitration in terms of how we see it being practiced in more developed arbitral jurisdictions or historically developed arbitration jurisdictions around the world. So what does that mean? In the early days of my practice as counsel in, in, uh, before civil law tribunals in, in Brazil, uh, I, would have, I expected the tribunals to be more interventionist. I think the practice of uh, the, the counsel who sat as arbitrators or judges who former judges who sat as arbitrators, was to focus more on defining the procedure themselves and having the parties fit in to that procedure. I think that the evolution has now gone more towards, let's say, a middle ground, whereby the parties and the arbitrators are engaged in more of a conversation. And if I look at the civil law versus a common law distinction, a common law judge uh, or arbitrator is going to be more willing to allow the parties to define their arbitration, whereas the civil law arbitrator would take a greater role, in my experience, in directing the issues to be, uh, to be addressed and directing the proceedings. Today, I think that irrespective of whether it's a 
all Brazilian arbitration or all American arbitration uh, or a hybrid, I think what tends to happen is that there's more of a melding of, uh, of the two models. Interesting. Uh, thank you, uh, Arif. Um, and do, uh, do you agree with Arif? And uh, if so, um, uh, why? In the, and let me just uh, also ask a follow-up question. Do you think at the stage of international arbitration now, do you think there is this common ground or common law arbitrators tend to be less interventionist than civil law arbitrate. Let me ask just a, a very mundane question. Let's assume that uh, you are you are an arbitrator in in a, in a case, a hearing where there is a translation. Is it a, you know, a witness speaking in a foreign language, but you understand the language of the witness, although it's not the language of the arbitration itself. And uh, you see there is a mistranslation a mistranslation by the translated interpreter. Would you tend to clarify that or you leave this for counsel and the redirect to save that situation? Would you be more um, inclined to interfere or just let it go? Well, in my experience, what I would do is actually wait to see if counsel was able to correct it. And if not, then I would bring the issue before everyone at that point in time. But I would let the counsel go forward first. And I think that, that um, back to your very first question, which was whether or not I agreed with RF. Yes, I, I do agree with him. I think we've seen this, this melding. Um, I find it interesting that when I appear before civil arbitrators, they're often less involved in intervening than some of the common law uh, arbitrators. And I see the civil law arbitrators often waiting to ask their questions after the entire presentation, where with the common law, you will see them inserting questions during the course of the testimony. And in many instances are much more activist than you would anticipate in the arbitration setting. But generally, I think there's a balance that's occurred. And that's the reason for that is many things. I think the education about international arbitration and what it is has expanded exponentially over the last 10 or 15 years. There are so many journals now that didn't exist before. There are opportunities for the students. You know, the Viz Mood is in its what, 28th year, I think now. And so you have this whole group of young people that have come through and have been exposed to various uh, arbitration rules and concepts. And so there's a greater sense of knowledge about the entire area and practice of law than existed even in 1996, which is the year that uh, RF mentioned that he got involved. So it's all grown exponentially. And because of that, I do think uh, there is a melding. And I do think there is a pushback, though, because there are, especially in some civil law uh, jurisdictions, an idea that arbitration has become too common law, too un-Americanized. So there is that, that push-pull that is still going on. Uh, it, it, it's interesting that you brought up this, uh, this very last issue. And I have here um, the ICDR arbitration rules um, uh, and this is the 2014 rules, although it does it hasn't changed in the latest, the March 21 rules. And this is Article 2110. And I read this. It says depositions, interrogatories, and requests to admit as developed for use in the U.S. court procedures generally are not appropriate procedures for obtaining information in an arbitration under these rules. So this is a serene message to the world community that arbitration, especially international arbitration, is something uh, different than domestic one. So the idiosyncrasies, the characteristics of a domestic arbitration may not be appropriate, may not be useful for international arbitration. Valeria, would like to add any 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 comment on this on this on this issue? 
No, um, just one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I fully agree with with both and 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 Arif uh, regarding the evolution that we have been um, witnessing uh, in international arbitration and in Brazilian arbitration as well. Um, it's very interesting that uh, in Brazilian domestic cases, we are actually uh, going in the same direction as international practice, which is which is quite interesting. We've been uh, seeing many parties and arbitrators applying certain techniques that were uh, always related to international proceedings now to fully domestic cases. And, and this goes uh, directly to the comment I wanted to add is that not only we have, as mentioned by, by both Arif and Anne, uh, more knowledge and, and, and access to that knowledge, which is also very important and exchange between you know common law uh, practitioners and civil law practitioners, but we also have more experience. And I really believe that when you have more, for instance, civil law uh, lawyers acting in international cases, um, if they are doing their job uh, well done, they will be you know uh, experimenting and getting in touch with different techniques and they will be able to select which ones they think will be more efficient for them to be convinced. Because by the end of the day, and I always say that, what the council has to aim is to convince the arbitrator. And he has then to use any tool that he has or he knows to, for, uh, you know, aiming to that purpose. So whether or not it's, it comes from common law or civil law, it's, it's irrelevant. The thing is, you have to try to use what you have in your, you know, available and in your advantage, and 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 for that reason, I think that what we are seeing right now is, you know, arbitrators and parties uh, choosing uh, the the techniques that they believe would be more suitable for that particular case, and this is international arbitration. International arbitration, by the end of the day, is the possibility of having your proceedings tailor-made. Right, yes, the, 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 the challenge becomes when counsel for the parties, they do not reach uh, an agreement as to the tool, the right tool, uh, because of lack of knowledge, because of some strategy, etc. but the, the tools are on the table for the parties to tailor their case, as you properly mentioned. I, I'm very glad that Anne has mentioned the Vismut. By the way, next week is, is the Vismut week. And I, I've been impressed by the level of the students in these uh, competitions. And these students are going to be counsel and arbitrator tomorrow. And uh, they come with a very much international mindset for, uh, uh, to the market. Let me move on to... I think one. Arif wanted to make a comment. I don't know. He raised his hand. I don't know. Oh, sure. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you. I just, if I may, to punctuate the points that were made by Valeria and Anne. I mean, Anne started with the, the, the push and the pull that's taking place. And I think that that's something that we should not, uh, that we need to focus on more. And Valeria uh, followed up at the end by, of her comments by focusing on the need to tailor make uh, a proceeding. And I think what's happened in arbitration globally between the civil law world and the common law world is that globalization of arbitral culture and education has led to a degree of homogenization. And I think that that homogenization is really dangerous to uh, arbitration as a procedural tool. And I, I for one, am a, you know, I'm against the constancy of rules and guidelines and trainings that tend to focus on, uh, on, on trying to create a commonality of how we should approach cases, not only as arbitrators, but then ultimately as, as counsel. Uh, I think that the individuality of arbitrators and the individuality of proceedings needs to be focused on. And one of the things that we would extol as a virtue of arbitration was that it was, as Valeria was saying, a tailor-made proceeding to be able to address the specifics of a particular dispute 
in a conversation between the parties as well as the arbitrators. And I think what has happened is that parties have become too litigious, so they don't talk to each other about the proceedings. And the arbitrators have become too passive uh, in terms of getting involved in defining what it is that is an appropriate procedure for that case. And, and so we end up with this kind of vanilla uh, of, of arbitration, which I think is very dangerous for, for what, is, what is happening to uh, our area of practice. Uh, Arif, um, yes, we are going to touch on this issue a, a, a little bit further when we discuss the conduct of the, uh, of the proceedings. I, sometimes I use an expression that people don't like, but based on my experience, I, use, I tend to say that what we are seeing today is an internationalization of American or Anglo-Saxon arbitration and uh, Anglo-Saxonization of international arbitration. So we, this is where we, there is a sort of a, a, a melting uh, uh, tools uh, on the table and it's for the parties uh, to pick whatever tool fits better on their case. Now, let me just uh, uh, move on. It is a very, um, uh, it's more specific topic. It's not as open than the first one, which is the arbitrator's appointment. We've seen more and more objections, challenges. We've seen also some uh, set aside proceedings, vacatur proceedings based on the lack of uh, proper disclosure uh, uh, depicting as a sort of a lack of uh, impartiality. So my question uh, to you, Anne, if I may, uh, is party appointed arbitrator at stake? Or rather, it simply represents a well-established right of the parties and an essential phase of the arbitration process. Where do we think we go? Well, my position is that the, one of the most important things a party can do is to select the appropriate arbitrator. And that therefore the idea of, intervene, of interviewing arbitrators, for example, is extremely important. Now, there are some arbitrators that don't want to be interviewed. I, I like to tell this story. A couple of years ago, we had a case in which we'd identified three potential arbitrators all within the same barrister's chambers. And we wrote an email to each of them to try to set up an interview. The first one readily agreed to an interview. The second one said they would only respond to written questions. And the third said, you can see my CV. So even within the common law system, you have a difference as to whether or not interviews should take place. But for me personally, having an interview as counsel is extremely important because I might have a client that is not going to be perceived particularly well. And I, I want to see in the discussion with this arbitrator if I can get a feel for how the arbitrator might act in the particular arbitration. Not how he's going to rule, but just you know how he how he might act. I know that there's a lot of people that push for the idea that the arbitrator should be appointed by the institutions, but that takes the human factor out of it. And I think the human factor is extremely important in arbitration. If in fact, it's simply going to be picking from a roster by an institution, then pretty soon you're moving into almost the artificial intelligence arena that everyone is talking about because you've lost that human point. And the human point, and this goes back to what Arif was talking about and starting a conversation with the arbitrators and, and attempting to create your rapport with the arbitrators and put your facts before them, all goes back to what arbitrator has been selected. And if I might actually put in a plug here for a moment for the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, they have a whole series of guidelines, and one of them that they do have is on interviewing arbitrators and what would be appropriate and what is not appropriate, because there are people who try to overstep the bounds when they are interviewing the arbitrators. 
Yeah, that's why I asked the question first, <laughs> so, you, so, so that you could make that comment regarding Thank the Thank you for the softball. I appreciate it. Institute of Arbitration. Uh, Valeria, in uh, Arif, um, um, uh, when, uh, do you have an experience on being interviewed? Uh, and if this, the interview comes from uh, a U.S. council or Brazilian council, would you uh, set up some um, rules up front or you just let it go and place questions the way they should be? Valeria? Um, yes, I have been interviewed and especially by foreigner partner parties. Um, actually, I have never been interviewed by Brazilian council or Brazilian parties, which is, which is quite interesting. I think that there is still not uh, the tradition or maybe council do not think that there is the need of doing so. It is still, although very developed, it is still a small group of arbitrators and especially independent arbitrators who are acting. And normally, council do know the arbitrator that they are nominating and uh, they would, you know, just uh, discuss the matter directly with their clients. So I, I have to say that my experience with respect to, to interviews has always been from U.S. Council or other Latin American Council and parties, because which which became which became very frequent right now is to have a um, you know represent in-house council or whatever in the interview. That that happened to me already uh, more than a couple of times. As far as the and I think it's useful. I I fully agree with Anne. Uh, I think I think that it's very important for for counsel and for the party too, not only to understand, for instance, how an arbitrator would, would react or to, you know, not exactly, you know, have his position, but how he would act before certain circumstances, but also to see how that person uh, interacts. Because again, uh, I think that the interaction between arbitrators is is underestimated. And actually, in my opinion, it is crucial for you to have a person, especially a co-arbitrator, that you at least think uh, that will be able to, to interact properly uh, within the deliberation. Um, and as far as your question goes, uh, with respect to, to the boundaries for that interview, I, I've never, I've never uh, predefined the, the limits, but I have to say that I've never been in a situation in which I thought those boundaries were being um, not respected. Uh, but um, for the time being, and, and again, uh, unless I have a different experience and I, I think uh, that starts to be something uh, necessary, I would simply just um, in case something improper happens, I would simply just say that I would not answer that question. But I have to say that if something improper happens, I would also consider whether or not accepting the nomination. I, I don't think I'll, I'll, I would be I would be feeling comfortable after I've realized that a council or a party is trying to take some sort of advantage of the situation. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, good comments. Yes. Uh, this is basically a cultural issue. Uh, Brazilians tend to be more talkative uh, than uh, uh, U.S., especially in the interviews. Um, Arif, you are smiling a little bit, so you want to add uh, something on this? Uh, on, on the subject, well, maybe on, on, <laughs> on you know, the, both subjects of interviews and, uh, and the right of appointment. Uh, on the on the issue of interviews, I mean, I've been interviewed by, uh, by as a party appointed arbitrator by the party that's seeking to appoint me, and I've been interviewed uh, jointly by the parties when I've been uh, when I've been considered as uh, a chairperson of of a tribunal, and that that has been you know that's an interesting experience in terms of uh, uh, actually being questioned by uh, by both council. But I set very strict uh, guidelines. Um, I think it's very important. I usually will send them my guidelines in writing. It's not very. I mean, it's not. They're, they're not. They're not 
specific, but they're generally that I will I'll speak about my background, uh, about my you know my my uh, academic training, uh, about uh, you know general industry knowledge, but I will not discuss substantive issues, and I will not uh, discuss any specifics relating to the procedure of the case. And I let the parties know this in advance so that they can police themselves. And I let them know that if I feel that there is any question that is going to uh, uh, come close to the line or cross over the line, that I will uh, I will feel free to to to, to tell them so. Uh, I also let the parties know that I will be taking notes. And I should mention that uh, I ask for uh, the parties. Uh, to disclose whether they'll be recording uh, the the interview, uh, because I think that there are you know there are parties out there that would try and use uh, what is said in uh, a, an arbitrator interview um, later on for purposes of of, of a challenge, um, and I you know I think given the given that my arbitrator practice is really very globalized, um, I take these precautions because. There are different views that are held by, let's say, you know, parties in, in Asia, the Middle East, uh, in Africa, in Latin America, and in North America, with respect to what is appropriate and what is not, and what it is that's the role of the of of the arbitrator. So, you know, I found that I've had to evolve towards these sorts of uh, uh, you know general guidelines about uh, uh, being interviewed, and I have drawn inspiration and from uh, the Chartered Institute uh, uh, guidelines on, on arbitrator interviews. And I think on the issue, Mauricio, which uh, is, I think, one of the hottest issues right now in, uh, in, in arbitration about uh, how do we go about constituting the tribunal, I mean, one element is, <clears throat> I think the fundamental element is legitimacy. You know, the, the right or the ability to appoint your arbitrator as a party is one form in which the party sees legitimacy in the process because they they have somebody who they see there as looking out for their interests if not necessarily advocating i think from the other standpoint there's a system systemic legitimacy which is uh you know promoted by having greater diversity having greater speed I mean, one of the, what i mean by this is that when you have party appointment processes they tend to take a lot longer they're more contentious. When you have all the arbitrators being appointed by the institution, I think you have a greater possibility of diversity of a tribunal, new blood coming into the arbitral community, and you have quicker appointments, but then there, there is a, a greater burden on the institution and a greater disassociation on the part of the, of the parties uh, in, in terms of the constitution of the tribunal. So there's a legitimacy tension there. And I think that this is something that we need to focus on and it's something that we need to, to sort out uh, so that we achieve that balance between uh, party legitimacy uh, as well as you know, speed and diversity in terms of the, uh, the, the process of, of constitution of tribunals. In, uh, interesting, Arif. So, uh, so you, so you were saying that this is a sort. This is just a, a, a an idea for reflection, and uh, or you see this as a trend. Uh, uh, the arbitral tribunal being fully appointed by the institutions in order to fulfill this diversity, or the right of the parties are going to be there for a long time. The uh, I think. I'll tell you, I think the trend is going to be that there will be greater uh, uh, greater institutional appointments. I mean, there will be a trend towards institutional appointments, not only because of that parties are, elect, are going to elect that. Uh, I think that the rules will start uh, proceeding in that direction. But I also think that the procedures for challenges and the emphasis on transparency with respect to institutional appointments is going to grow. And so uh, as institutions take on more responsibility with respect to appointments, and I think that the Brazilian institutions need to look at this in the way that the American institutions are, that there will be, that the institutions will have a greater responsibility to, to, 
uh, to make in making those appointments, but they will also then have to be more transparent as to how they go about it, who is making the appointments, and then also with respect to the challenge criteria. I think that that's that that's going to happen within the next few years. And and if I can put a plug in for uh, uh, a book that I recently published called the Arbitration Rulebook, which is a cross comparison of all of the recent arbitral rules, um, of all the major arbitral rules, I think that you know one can see. Uh, how the arbitral institutions are beginning to compete with each other in terms of the appointment process and where that trend is going. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Arif. Uh, let me move on to uh, another topic. And this is, um, I, uh, perhaps we don't need to spend too much time on this one. Uh, and um, uh, this perhaps is something that I've seen uh, in practice uh, which is the terms of reference. Um, and this goes to Valeria. Valeria, all Brazilian institutions follow, somehow follow the ICC model based on the terms of reference as an essential tool at the outset of the case. As you know, neither ICDR, LCIA, CPR, um, uh, SIAC, other arbit major arbitral institutions in the world, uh, they do not contain such requirement as such terms of reference. Uh, uh, based on your experience, do you see any problems when you see Brazilians as parties, as counsel, in an international case, uh, based on other institutions where there is no such terms of reference, no termo de arbitragem. Uh, do you uh, so? Do you think they are prepared for just receiving an email saying, "Well, this is the preparatory conference, the preliminary conference. This is the agenda, and then after that, there, there is going to be a procedural order number one, and this procedural order number one is going to play." the role of the terms of reference. Do you, do you see a need for Brazilians to be more, uh, to receive an additional uh, uh, explanation on that? Or this is just a, a, a very, uh, I would say even silly issue that it's not a matter of concern. Thank you, Mauricio. I have to say that I think that the terms of reference in certain circumstances is, is really useful and, and even needed. But um, I agree that not necessarily in all cases. Um, but um, going back to your question, exactly, I, I do think that Brazilian parties would have difficulties, and, and they do have sometimes difficulties, even when the terms of reference are provided under the rules. Uh, uh, you know, because basically the 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 at least the understanding that Brazilian parties have of the terms of reference, which in my opinion is it's a little bit um, um, ill-founded, is that uh, this is where they have to put all the relief sought. So what we call in Portuguese, and which is a concept of civil procedural uh, rules, estabilização da demanda. They love that, and they love to have a document in which the so-called relief sought is already in there and cannot be modified within the proceedings. And, and they feel comfortable with that. When they do not have that, they feel really uncomfortable. And I, and I really had several cases in which, although we have the terms of reference provided under the rules, which is the case of the ICC rules, for instance, you were not uh, asked by the rules to have, for instance, the relief sought stabilized, as we call it in Portuguese, and, and then parties feel uncomfortable. So they, they still understand the terms of reference as being, and this is, in my opinion, misconceived, as being a, a document in which you already framed the dispute that is going to be solved by the arbitral tribunal. And in my opinion, the, the, the purpose of the terms of reference is not that. 
So uh, again, when they find themselves in a situation in which they will not rely on that document, uh, I really think they feel uncomfortable and they get more litigious because even though you're going to maybe introduce the same rules in a procedural order number one, they would not understand that they have the same boundaries that they would have if a terms of reference were uh, executed. Uh, uh, interesting. So it's a matter of uh, um, um, uh, concern uh, when you have then, uh, if I understood correctly, uh, Brazilian parties and there is no termo de arbitrage, there is no terms of reference. So it may be the case uh, of having a more litigious, contentious uh, uh, proceeding because of the lack of this stabilization. Um, interesting. Not only, if I may, not only with respect to the relief sought, but also regarding some procedural rules and, and, and silly ones, like uh, mm -hmm. a time limit for the submission or, mm -hmm. or how you're going to send your submissions. So they like to introduce everything in the terms of reference. This is cultural. Whenever you are trying to, you know, to make them understand that the terms of reference actually are not aimed to that, uh, and that all those rules can be shifted to a procedural order, they would still want even the procedural timetable to be introduced in the terms of reference. So this is very cultural. And again, I think that it, it, it comes from uh, procedural, civil procedural practice, but also from the practice that was introduced in the first years of arbitration in Brazil. And, and we cannot forget that arbitration started being uh, widely used in Brazil in uh, like 20, 20 years ago, not more than that. Um, and, and in the beginning, people would not be familiar with arbitration. So, so the rules had a more educational approach that they sh normally should obviously because you know the community was not prepared for that I, I think that it's time to evolve and maybe to let go some of those uh practices but again uh this is something that maybe institutions should consider yes so the, the way to deal with that to cope with that is to uh to foresee what may come up uh especially coming from brazilian council and just throw in the agenda in order to insert into the procedural order. So what I can, what I do sometimes here is not so much in the COVID, the pandemic times, the pandemic era that we are living in, but uh, when I see, when I envisage that uh, Brazilian parties or foreign parties are going to bring foreign witnesses. And at the day one, I say, well, since I can see there are potential foreign witness, so please take care of visa issues. Because I don't want to hear a week before, a month before hearing in New York, in Miami, that a key witness cannot come to the United States because he or she does not have visa. So if we deal with this very simple issue at the beginning of the case, it is a message to avoid problems down, down the road. Okay. Uh, unless Anne has uh, uh, wants to uh, uh, add any comment, this particular any experience, any comment, Anne, uh, on this issue of terms of reference, preparatory conference, preliminary conference, procedural number one. Thanks. Sure. Um, yes, and this is a very recent occurrence in a case in which I am sitting, and we have American parties or American counsel on both sides. And when it came time for the terms of reference and were under the ICC, they were willing to do the terms of reference as we requested. However, they wanted to have the ability to amend the terms of reference after they had had their document disclosure and were ready to put in their uh, pleadings, which of course we agreed to because the parties had agreed to have it that way. So I think at least from the American point of view, there's some hesitancy to have to frame your entire case at the very beginning. And they want to have this opportunity to revisit it 
as it proceeds along the way. And I think we also need to realize as arbitrators that the terms of reference have a very important point for us. And that is it sets forth the issues that you are authorized to determine. Therefore, it is possible for the parties to have expanded your jurisdiction by purpose, by terms of the terms of reference to include issues that might not actually had fallen within the original arbitration provision. And by having them sign those terms of reference, you now have your jurisdiction protected in order to go ahead and make those decisions. So I think it helps the parties and I think it also helps the arbitrators. But I do think when you have American counsel, there is this reluctance to put the entire case in a framework at the very beginning. Excellent, excellent, very good comments. Uh, and this leads me to, uh, to uh, a final comment on this issue that uh, sometimes the parties, they reach a settlement and they ask the tribunal to write an award on agreed terms. But those issues in the agreement fall apart, behind, or beyond the terms of reference, which sometimes invites the tribunal to amend the terms of reference in order to issue an award on agreed terms uh, to avoid any jurisdictional uh, uh, aspect uh, of the decision. Very nice. Um, so why don't we move to a more... Um, a more dynamic topic, which is the conduct of the proceedings. And um, now we have uh, 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 domestic arbitrations in Brazil, domestic arbitrations in the United States, international arbitrations, although we don't call international arb arbitration per se in Brazil. There is no such a thing of, there is an arbitration, uh, there is a foreign arbitral award or a local or a domestic arbitral award in Brazil, but there is no such difference between domestic and international arbitration, although we all know some of the peculiarities of uh, uh, an international arbitration. And based on that, we go to soft laws. And on soft laws, we go to international bar association, and specifically for the purpose of our discussion here is the taking on evidence uh, in international arbitration. Um, so, Valeria, you have you have mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago that uh, based on the development of arbitration in Brazil, so Brazil has been or has adopted some of the international uh, 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 procedure or uh, international approach. Um, this also in, does this include uh, IBA? rules on the taking of evidence? And if so, in which manner? Uh, as a, a, a guideline, guideline or just a, as a, uh, or in domestic case, it is rare to see the IBA rules playing any role in Brazil. No, I would say that we are increasingly using the IBA rules normally as guidelines, not not uh, as um, as a, a full menu to be mandatorily used by the arbitrators. But parties would would agree to 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 resort to the rules as guidelines. Um, I have to say that this is quite often in cases in which you have somehow a foreign interest in the dispute, although the case is purely domestic, meaning Brazilian parties, Brazilian seat, Brazilian council, Brazilian arbitrators, Brazilian law being applied Portuguese. So, but again, you may have a, a foreign interest in, in the dispute. Uh, and, and normally, obviously, the proposition comes from from more sophisticated counsel which are familiar to the rules or even the arbitrators. But we are seeing uh, it, the use being, uh, the, the rules, sorry, being used more frequently in domestic cases than, for instance, in five years ago. And uh, the interesting part is that party, Brazilian parties are even resorting to uh, techniques which 
are proposed in the rules, but normally would not be used by Brazilian Council. For instance, the use of written statements, and uh, uh, which is which is for us, uh, I think, for arbitrators in general, may be very helpful to to have at least. Uh, access to to those statements before a hearing you know that in in brazil the the um the usage is to to have only oral testimonies in the arbitration and what i would call the 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 surprise effect that you may have always in 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 hearings like this when you actually don't know exactly what the witness is going to to say or about what the witness is going to to testify, but um, what we are seeing more and more is 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 is, is the fact that parties are trying to be uh, to have more predictability with res with respect to the proceedings and how the arbitrators are going to to solve certain issues. For instance, uh, document production, because although a lot of people would say that document production is a, and, and since we are talking about differences between two worlds, is 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 a uh, com uh, common law um, practice. Uh, we all know that actually document production is already provided under the civil procedural rules. Maybe with not with the same extent. Or, or even with the same purpose that we will see, for instance, discovery in common law. But we do have, uh, under civil procedural rules, uh, the the mechanism is already there, is provided, and has some some standards. And and basically, what parties now are seeking in in domestic cases is to have it at least, as I said, predictability with respect to how the document production phase is going to be uh, put in place and which will be the um, standards that the arbitrators will follow uh, in their uh, decisions regarding the, those, uh, the requests for document production. And they are resorting more and more to, to, the, to the IB rules. And I thank you very much for the question because uh, as you know, I am uh, currently senior vice chair of the IB arbitration committee. And I have to say that we are very proud to, to have published the new, the revised, I, I don't want to say the new because there is no huge innovations in those rules. It's just really just a revision of the 2010 uh, it, uh, version of the rules, but we have now a, a new version in which we have specially uh, introduced some current techniques, especially regarding uh, remote hearings, and and made some you know smaller adjustments to what actually is is the current practice, which basically shows that the IBA rules are being used. Uh, by by both civil law and common law um, practitioners. Okay, uh, okay. Thank you, Valeria. Yeah. Um, in my experience, though, uh, I think the parties are yes, they are seeking for more predictability, for stability, everything you've you've just mentioned. Although I still see some hesitancy of using, for example, written statement, which would be something very important for cross-examination down the road. So arbitral tribunal would be more prepared, opposing counsel, both ones, would be also more prepared in order to um, uh, do the cross-examination. Uh, cross um, uh, uh, and uh, let me, uh, so, since Valeria, uh, has uh, uh, mentioned IBA in, uh, if time permitting, Valeria, perhaps you could uh, also uh, mention some of the uh, uh, the um, developments of new uh, the new rules. But uh, before, uh, let me ask Anne regarding another soft law on taking of evidence, which is the Prague rules. Prague rules are considered to be more civil law. Actually, if you know, if you see the drafters uh, of the Prague rules, uh, most of them come from civil law jurisdictions, specifically from Western Europe, with some uh, representative of this 
Western world, but it's basically civil law in Western Europe. Um, what's your take on the Prague rules and um, what is your, also your opinion as to how Prague rules will play a role in international arbitration in the future? Well, you know, the, you're absolutely right. The, uh, the Prague rules were developed um, in contrast to the IBA rules because there's a certain segment that feel that the IBA rules were actually too common law oriented. And I think they differ in two very major respects. The first relates to document disclosure itself. They require, as do the IBA rules, that you, the parties are to put forth the reliance documents. But unlike the IBA rules, which provide for document disclosure with use of a Redfern schedule, a party, if it wants additional documents, is to ask at the case management conference and direct that request to the tribunal, not to the other side. And if a party fails to request documents at the case management conference and then comes back later with a request for documents, it must justify why they made the delay in requesting the documents. And that is a very huge change from the common law and the idea that you get documents and you develop your case. The other has to do with experts. The IBA rules set out exactly how expert reports are to be done, and it's envisioned that the parties will hire their own experts. The Prague rules envision that it will be an expert that is hired by the tribunal. It does allow, the rules do allow the parties to get their own experts if necessary. So this is two huge changes from the IBA rules. I will tell you as a common law lawyer that I would resist using the Prague rules. I think the IBA rules are an appropriate step in one, pushing away from the very broad discovery that Americans are used to in court but at the same time allowing a limited discovery which gives comfort to the parties in the process of doing their case. And I think it's also very much ingrained in the common law that you have your own expert as opposed to a tribunal expert. And I think there's this fear, a loss, a fear of loss of control if you do not have your own expert that is going to be testifying. And we all realize that under the IBA rules, it clearly says that that expert is to be independent. He is to have reached his own opinions. It is, he is not to be a hired gun. And you sometimes do see in arbitration where someone has gone out, especially American parties, and will get an expert who's trying to be an advocate. And, and that particular expert is going to be dressed down by the tribunal for having acted like an advocate. So the civil, the civil rules that you see in the Prague, in the Prague rules, I think will clearly be adopted by those who are from civil law countries that are comfortable with it. But for those of us in the common law, the IBA rules are indeed the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And uh, in my experience in, in, in cases where I, I deal with uh, as arbitrator in, in in purely domestic case, purely civil law cases, I haven't seen yet a case where the parties have suggested the Prague rules, or even the tribunal has suggested to use the Prague rules as guidelines. I don't know what may come down the road, but um, I think the Prague rules uh, contain, as you mentioned, some uh, issues that are uh, very, uh, I would say, aggressive, for the lack of a better word, for a common law lawyer. But let me ask Arif and perhaps Anne also, one specific topic that comes from the Prague rules, which is, there is one article that says, Jura Novit Curia. Jura Novit Curia. And, um, and, I, and, and I read this, a party be bears the burden of proof with respect to the legal position on which it relies. So far, so good. Then 7.2, however, the arbitral tribunal may apply legal provisions not pleaded by the parties if it finds it necessary. Um, and then the tribunal shall seek the party's views on the legal provision it intends to apply. Uh, as a common law lawyer, 
what is your uh, uh, opinion of the principle of Uranov et Curia? Would you, now, regardless the application of any rules, would you, if one party pleads something uh, uh, and uh, you search a different legal uh, aspect of that pleading, would you be silent? Would you invite the parties to uh, to comment? So what is your take on the Yura Novet Curia aspect, which contains the Prague rules, but regardless of the use of the Prague rules? Arif? Uh, very interesting uh, question, Maurizio. Uh, you know, I think as a, as a common law trained lawyer and even a lawyer who spent a lot of time working on, on civil with civil law uh, related matters uh, I I am very uncomfortable with going beyond what it is that the parties have have pled uh, you know I my practice has been to uh, to to consult with other members of the tribunal to raise issues uh, for the parties if they so wish to address them. Uh, but I, you know, I would feel very uncomfortable going beyond what it is that's you know, before me. I mean, for the most part, members of tribunals are extremely experienced in international legal matters and you know, legal analytics in terms of fact finding. Uh, and so we have a desire to try and reach the truth. Uh, we have a desire, we feel that we're obliged to try and reach the most just decision, and especially in international arbitration, to sometimes try to accommodate what may be a, an experiential weakness on the part of one of the, of one of the, 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 the parties or their counsel. Uh, but I think it's, you know, I, I, I personally feel very uncomfortable going beyond the, uh, beyond the arguments and the evidence that the, that the parties have have uh, have presented. I think that that's just probably a reflection of my uh, more heavily common law uh, background. Thank you. And any thoughts on that? Personally, I don't think this is a black and white question. I think we have to look at what has not been pled or what issue needs to be looked at to finally make the determination as to whether or not the issue is going to be raised. I actually sat on a tribunal a number of years ago in which there was one issue that had not been addressed by either party and the tribunal sat and discussed it for some length and finally decided that they would bring the issue to the party's attention. But in doing so, we were extremely careful to say that we had not prejudged any issue in the case, but it seemed to us that this might be an issue which we would like to have addressed. That very evening, I went to dinner with a QC who was sitting on another tribunal and we were discussing this dilemma. And they had reached, they had the same issue arise in their case and they had reached the different conclusion that they would not raise the issue that um, with the parties and that they would just go with what the parties had put before them. And so that's why I say it depends. It depends on what that issue is and can it be framed in such a way that it doesn't prejudice either party to bring it to the party's attention? Or should you simply rely on what is put before you? And so I can't give you a black and white answer in this instance. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Now, a more um, provocative question to, uh, to all of you. Uh, and I would start with um, um, Valeria and perhaps some sort of a, um, running the risk of stereotyping a little bit. But um, to you, uh, Valeria and Anne or Arif, do you think Brazilian counsel is underprepared to cross-examine witness? And, and Arif, do you think the American counsel is over-prepared to cross-examine witness? Or this is just a matter of being experienced or not? Should I start? Yes, please. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe Arif wants to 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 have that. It's a tough question, and <laughs> I don't wanna I don't wanna step in anybody's toes. But in any case, um, I don't think there is over prepared and under prepared. I think that 
the, the, the issue is that normally civil law practitioners would not give the same importance to witnesses than common law practitioners. So it's not the same way. And, and, and for that simple reason, we will simply not dedicate the same time, effort, and, and you know, um, uh, resources to trying to have a comprehensive and, and uh, detailed uh, cross-examination. I think this this not the fact of being over or under. It's just the importance that you, you give to that type of evidence. That being said, what I've, and again, I think it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's, it's an evolution. What I've been uh, seeing in many of my domestic cases is that Brazilian lawyers are using many techniques that they've learned in LLMs or in training courses uh, for cross-examination, but adapting it to the so-called audience, meaning adapting it to the arbitrator. And what does that mean? Uh, for a civil law practitioner who is sitting as an arbitrator, it can be sometimes a little bit, um, I would say boring, to see a cross-examination that will go through issues such as, what does the contract says? Have you read this clause? For us, it's just normally, and, and I understand this is an you know an exercise that the council is doing in order to 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 evolve in the argument and to have uh, a certain uh, um, um, declaration being made by the witness. But for from a civil law perspective, sometimes it looks like something a little bit you know useless or irrelevant. The tribunal has already read the contract. The tribunal knows the contract. Why, why are you asking the witness to read the contract? So, so again, it, it has nothing to do with preparation. It has to do with the mechanisms that counsel and arbitrator use for decision-making, for uh, uh, arguing a case. Uh, but we do see some things, and, 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 and I think we're going back to what we were talking in the beginning of our conversation of, you know, having uh, the opportunity of uh, getting in touch with different techniques and adapting them to your concrete needs. So I, I see an evolution. But again, I, I, I understand when a, when a Brazilian practitioner will not follow a... Um, a pure technique of cross-examination because he's dealing with arbitrators that they are not looking for that and they do not want that basically okay all right uh perhaps i should uh, i should have uh, uh explained a little bit more what i meant by over prepared uh and let me give you an example to end in arif once i was sitting as a co-arbitrator in a case involving a u.s and brazilian party by the way and the witness was a brazilian and counsel uh, was cross-examined was a u.s and all of us uh, and during the the course of the cross-examination counsel was starting to toast the witness pushing the witness against the wall in a very aggressive manner very perhaps a little bit of a u.s style very aggressive in pre the president who was an english lawyer who has been in the united states for many decades say so counsel we don't do that here you should rephrase your question in a different manner it's just a matter of it's a matter of behavior, not so much about content. I would like to hear your thoughts and and Arif on that. Well, uh, I think I would put it down, uh, put it to put it in the following terms. I mean, it's sort of like whether whether the meat should be ben pasada or mal pasada, right? I mean, I think that they, <laughs> I think. The American style cross examination, or the UK, the English laws, English QCs, or barrister style of cross examination, is intended to serve a particular purpose within that within the legal systems, uh, 
within the American or the or the English legal systems. Um, I mean, I agree with Valeria that cross examination tends to, you know, is overdone uh, in in international arbitrations. I think that it's really more a question of style. Uh, some people try to use a more theatrical style uh, to uh, wear down a witness uh, to try and. Uh, uh, find contradictions in the witness's testimony. I think all of that is very, you know, is 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 legitimate. Uh, there are softer approaches to to cross examination, and I see that mostly with the civil law trained lawyers, uh, who may not be asking the closed ended questions, but it's still just as effective. And my experience has been that the civil law trained lawyers who are now engaging in cross examinations on a more regular basis. Uh, tend to focus a lot more on issues of relevance uh, to uh, uh, to the tribunal. I find the cross examinations to be more pointed. Uh, the cross examinations to focus more on the evidence that uh, is relevant. Whereas uh, the common law trained lawyer who goes into cross examination in an international arbitration will use it more as a deposition to try and explore everything under the sun, including things that don't necessarily appear. Uh, in the witness statement. Um, and that's because as common law lawyers or an American trained lawyer, before I go into trial, I've typically had the opportunity to depose a witness. Um, and you know, when I go into the hearing, this may be my only opportunity to gain evidence or gather evidence from that witness, not only for the particular proceeding, but potentially for other purposes. So you know, there are you know, just a question of different objectives. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I can see that uh, uh, Lauro has shown up, and when Lauro uh, appears on the screen, so it's a sort of a yellow light for, uh, for us in terms of timing. Um, uh, so I would uh, certainly, I would uh, uh, invite Anne to make her comments on this, uh, on this issue, which is a cultural uh, issue, behavior, style, etc. Um, but I would like, if possible, I would like to bring a subject which is, or perhaps is, a very foreign to Brazilians. And this is the uh, procedural tool which is commonly called a Section 1782. Um, and um, uh, I would like, in to make some uh, general comments about the Section 1782 procedure, and uh, perhaps uh, Arif also could uh, then step in, making some uh, specific uh, comments uh, on the practical uh, use of those of, of this uh, tool. So please, Anne. Uh, may I first comment just a moment on cross-examination? Um, and I'd like to point out that I think that what happens is, especially if you get someone who's very aggressive on cross-examination or as Valeria talked about, is cross-examining on issues that don't really matter. Basically, they're already in the witness statement. You've already seen the contract. Is actually a holdover from the fact that that person was trained as a U.S. trial lawyer and he was going before a jury. And therefore, he or she felt like they had to put every issue in front of them. And you see this even today with uh, parties, the council is one of the same issues over and over and over again with each witness. You know, it's been proved, we've got it. You don't need to have every witness prove that issue. For anyone who would like to study a bit more about the common law approach to cross-examination, there was a wonderful YouTube video done by the late Irving Younger called The Ten Commandments of Cross-Examination. Very entertaining, very well done, and teaches you how to do those closed-end questions. Now, moving on to section 1782, and thank you for letting me And know. And if I may, if I may, I just one minute uh, on Valeria's uh, uh, comment on the importance of witness. Uh, I, I, I just forgot. And uh, I agree with her. Uh, uh, common law or U.S. Uh, the importance that is given to the witness is far more than the importance that Brazilians or civil law give to witness. And there is one sentence that perhaps summarizes this. 
for, a, um, for an American, the sun has not risen until a witness says so. With that, you can proceed with the section 1782. Okay, great, 1782. 1782 is a section, uh, 28 USC section 1782 has actually been around since uh, 1800s. It's been modified and the last time it was modified, I'm not quite certain when that was, I think 1955, 1960, but it's a tool that allows uh, a parties to obtain discovery, and that's the right word, discovery from a potential witness in aid of a foreign tribunal. Now, what is a foreign tribunal? And that is where the issue lies. There is no question that a foreign tribunal will include, for instance, an ICSID tribunal. However, there is a split of authority in the United States as to whether or not 28 USC 1782 can be used for private commercial arbitration. If the second, the fifth, and the seventh circuits have all held that it does not extend to private commercial arbitration. The third and the fourth have held the opposite. The reason there is confusion is because of the US Supreme Court's case decision in Intel. And in Intel, in dicta, they referred to an article written by Hans Schmidt in which he says that foreign tribunal includes arbitration tribunals. Now, the significance of this is that because there is this split among the circuits, you can actually have a case in which you attempt to get testimony from one witness in the United States and that be granted, and in the same arbitration, attempt to get testimony from another witness that resides in another circuit and not be allowed to have that particular discovery. And that's exactly what has happened in the Servotronics case. There were two cases, Servotronics versus Boeing and Servotronics versus Rolls-Royce. The Fourth Circuit held that in the Rolls-Royce case that Rolls-Royce had to, the party that would, they were trying to get in this instance, Rolls-Royce, would have to produce documents. The Seventh Circuit in the Boeing case, Servotronics versus Boeing, took the opposite position and said that no, discovery was not to be allowed because Intel did not extend to private commercial arbitration. For a long time, the international arbitration community has wanted this issue to be addressed because of this split and, it, and never has the issue made it to the US Supreme Court. But on Monday, the US Supreme Court did grant cert in the Servotronics versus um, Boeing case. And so therefore we're finally gonna get some resolution on whether or not 1782 does extend to private commercial arbitrations. Okay, um, thank you, Anne. I, um, I would like, uh, Arif, um, I know you have comments on that, uh, uh, and this actually, this would uh, lead to a specific uh, uh, event to discuss 1782. But if you can, um, assuming that a foreign tribunal is a commercial arbitration tribunal, just for the sake of discussion, how do you see a, a, a council addressing this or going to court, getting the, uh, some of the uh, discovery witness or documents, etc., before or aside of the arbitral tribunal? Well, Odisha, I, I would expect uh, uh, council to have kept the uh, uh, arbitral tribunal in, informed of the, uh, of, of the application uh, for, uh, for such information uh, and third party discovery. And so long as the uh, documents, materials, the evidence has been legitimately obtained, has been legally obtained by a party, uh, I think that it uh, would be uh, considered admissible by, by tribunals, whether investor state uh, or, or commercial. So, you know, my, my sense is that uh, uh, parties are, are well advised to uh, ensure that the tribunal is apprised 
uh, and where necessary to have even taken the permission of the tribunal so as not to disrupt the proceedings, the arbitral proceedings that are underway while the 1782 proceedings, which may take longer, are, are, uh, are evolving. Okay, thank you, Arif. Uh, Valeria, this issue of 1782, although this is a particular tool in the United States, there is no such 1782 elsewhere. There is no such 1782 in Brazil. But we are talking here, uh, the relationship, if I should say, uh, between the arbitral tribunal and the courts. How do you see uh, uh, the, what can, can be done from the arbitral tribunal's perspective, uh, for example, regarding a um, uh, reluctant witness, uh, witness does not, does not want to show up. Uh, so what is the, uh, in, in other words, what is the relationship between tribunal and the courts in Brazil, as far as Brazilian practice is concerned? Just, just one quick comment of we do not have it's it, you're correct when you say we do not have a uh, similar provision, but we do have a tool prior to arbitration proceedings, which is the produção antecipada de prova, and uh, and with that specific tool, uh, a party may be able to 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 produce prior to the commencement of an arbitration. Uh, evidence that might be relevant to the case. And I think, given the broad terms that are used by the civil procedure code that you may use, and obviously this is my position, that you may use uh, that uh, in relation to arbitrations and in relation to arbitrations, uh, who, which place of arbitration is not even based in Brazil. Uh, if the evidence is in Brazil or even the, the uh, the uh, defendant is based in Brazil, I, I think you, you, you're able to, to use that tool. But again, this is prior to the arbitration. When, when the arbitration has already started, uh, we do have a particular uh, mechanism provided uh, under the Brazilian arbitration law, and, and which I think it's, it's really uh, particular to, to our law, which is the Carta Arbitral. Uh, and that actually allows arbitrators to uh, directly communicate to judicial authorities and ask for uh, their support in uh, cohesively uh, producing a certain evidence. So, um, and, and, and we've used that in a couple of cases uh, uh, in arbitral tribunals in which I was uh, sitting, and I've seen that being used also by, by other arbitrators quite frequently, and it does work. Right, uh, uh, and, and, and I agree with you, uh, uh, especially or essentially in domestic cases. I see some challenges if the tribunal would issue a carta arbitral uh, for a foreign judge. Uh, that, I, I that see, I see, Mauricio, I see issues, and this is not clear to me yet, whether a tribunal sitting outside Brazil could issue, or if a judicial authority in Brazil would recognize such an instrument coming from a tribunal sitting outside Brazil, even if the arbitrators are Brazilian. I, I'm not sure whether or not uh, judges will, will accept that, but in any right. case. Right, yes, yeah, no, yes, you're right. Um, so uh, let me pause and ask Lauro um, at this time. Um, so uh, how far can we go? Uh, how long do we have? Uh, how many minutes <laughs> at this stage? By the book, we have three minutes. Three minutes, three uh, minutes, okay. But of so, course, this is a Brazilian and US webinar, so you can delay a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you know, this is this is typical uh, international arbitration. I like the flexibility. Uh, so uh, I like the flexibility, but uh, I also am very uh, 
also mindful about uh, time uh, for everyone here and also for the audience. Um, so in these three to uh, four or five minutes, um, perhaps I should um, just, uh, uh, I would like to perhaps to wrap up uh, and ask a very uh, a general questions to all of you in terms of um, uh, uh, to look ahead. So let's look just a one minute for each, uh, if you may. And the question is, uh, with uh, so many players coming in, newcomers, parties, arbitrators, counsel in the world of arbitration today, um, has the romantic golden age of arbitration gone or a new area, new era has just begun? One minute each. I guess that means I'm on. Um, I don't think the golden age is gone, but I think that it's going to have a patina that it hasn't had before. I think that you're going to see more cases, the smaller cases being done uh, via platforms. I think you're going to see the larger cases being done just as they've always been done with the possibility of having to bring in a few witnesses via a video platform because of visa issues or health issues or something like that. But those are the cases that can still support the travel and the infrastructure that is needed for an in-person hearing. So because we now have become comfortable with remote hearings, I think you actually may see an uptick in the number of smaller cases that are filed because it now has become financially feasible to bring those cases where in the past it might not have been. So it's the golden age, but it's burnished a bit. Quick question. Uh, in this, uh, do you think, and that mediation is going to uh, find a place from now on? Well, I'm actually glad we you- think asked. We think the arbitration system. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually glad you asked that question because obviously we have the Singapore convention and it has a few signatories at this time, but it was my great pleasure to actually chair the ICDR's rule revision committee. And in the process, we also revised the mediation rules for the first time since 2008. And the ICDR and I think all the other institutions are all supporting this idea of mediation in conjunction with or before arbitration. So I do think that it is, is something that you're going to see greater growth, and I think the Singapore Convention is going to allow that. You're on mute. Thank you, Anne. Valeria? Your final comment? I fully, I've, no, I fully agree with Anne. I, I don't think that the golden era is over. Uh, I think that we are basically um, you know, in a different a different way of doing arbitration, but uh, we haven't lost the essence. It, it, we are just adapting to a uh, more virtual world, more globalized world with new players and a new way of doing it. But but I think we're still I mean we're still there, and and I still think that arbitration is going to be. Um, used widely by by the international community and as Anne said I, I, I agree that we are going to to, to, to see a, a rise of, of smaller cases since it is a mechanism that became more more available and also a rise of new players as far as arbitrator goes because many of the difficulties of having for instance a Latin American arbitration acting in a European case was was uh, the the cost of having a person so far uh, traveling and etc and so it's it's going to be interesting to see how it evolves but we're still in the golden era I think. All right, good to hear that. Last but not least, Mr. Ali. Let me be controversial and perhaps uh, set us up for a uh, for, for for the next participants in the next uh, 
in the next session. I think that the golden era is over. Um, uh, you know, I think that the golden era of uh, international arbitration, uh, in terms of real developments in the in the procedure and in the process, uh, was probably in you know in the course of the in the 50s through to the, the 70s in the uh, post World War II era. And I think that we, as an arbitral community, have done this to ourselves. I think that we have uh, arbitration has tended to become more our litigation. I think that we have. Uh, the, the practice, of course, has become much more diversified, which is great. But I also think that the in term, diversified in the sense of more participants, uh, more diversity of counsel, greater sophistication across the globe. But by the same token, I think the over litigiousness of, of parties, I think the temerity of arbitrators, uh, I think the over regulation of arbitration, uh, has uh, has begun to erode some of what it is that arbitration uh, was actually intended to to achieve as a dispute resolution mechanism, and I think that the challenge of uh, to arbitration will come from uh, greater incidence of of mediation, uh, simply because that's what the users uh, will want as a result of for, for purposes of cost savings, and we shouldn't discount the uh, impact that. Um, that international commercial courts uh, will have on uh, the the uh, the use of arbitration as a mechanism for cross border dispute resolution. So you know, can we can we return to a golden era? Uh, I think so, but I think that that's going to require uh, us taking a hard look at ourselves uh, and not just using the same recipe over and over again with a little bit more salt or a little bit less salt. Uh, but more innovation and uh, more creativity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, um, and unfortunately, I have to say we've reached uh, the closing of our program. It's It was a great pleasure sharing this panel, this event with Anne Ryan, Valeria, and Arif Ali. With that, I pass the mic over to Laura for his final remarks. And again, thank you very much for your wonderful remarks. Thank you. No, just uh, thank you also. And uh, thank you our sponsors, the sponsors of the arbitration channel, the sponsor of the arbitration two words, Mauricio, Anne, Valeria, and Ari. Thank you very much. I hope to see you again, maybe in person or someday, <laughs> but uh, for now, that's the way we see you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.